Increasing faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. I need your continued faithful financial support if ever increasing faith television is to remain on the air in your area. On the screen is an address where you can mail your tithe offering or gift of love. Let me take this opportunity to thank you so very much for your past, your present, and whatever future support you're led to give. Remember, you are helping to make it happen. All right, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 6. Romans chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 6. Have you all been behaving yourself while I was gone? All right. Nope. Yeah. Truth comes out, huh? Okay. Praise the Lord. All right. We had a great time. It was wonderful ministry. All right. Ephesians. What did I say? Yeah, I got to get back in Romans chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 6. We'll look at Romans 4 first. Romans chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 6. Now, in the, we started last time. It was almost um, not very good idea to start something and then have to leave right after that. But anyway, we can catch up. Romans, the fourth chapter, if you have it, see, I have it. All right. Uh, I see, what do we want to talk about? Uh, Romans 4, beginning with verse 17. It says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants or seed be. And not being weak in what? He did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver or stagger at the promise of God to unbelief, but was strengthened, or literally, as the tradition says, strong where? In faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced or persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he, God, was also able to perform. I want you to notice very carefully verse 19. It says, and not being weak in faith. And then it says, but he was strong in faith in faith in verse 20 and those are opposites weak and strong very important distinction it didn't say God didn't make Abraham weak or God made Abraham strong it said he was not weak and he but he was strong in faith so apparently it took faith on the part of Abraham even though God had made a promise for the promise to come to pass so it's a it's a dual situation it's not just God promised and it's going to happen regardless of what we do think or, or how we act, but that it's going to take faith on our part, in the case of Abraham, faith on his part to bring the promise to pass. So we see strong faith, weak faith, in juxtaposition to each other. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, if you please. <clears throat> All right, Ephesians chapter 6, if you have it, say I have it. All right, verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be something. Be strong in the Lord and in the power, or literally the strength, of his might. Finally, my brethren, be something. Not pray something. Not think something. Be that. Finally, my brethren, be Strong in the Lord. The only way to be strong in the Lord is by being strong in faith. Simply because God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, is a faith God. Everything he does is by faith. And so, if we want the benefit of what Jesus bought and paid for, which is more than just missing hell when you die and going to heaven, which a lot of Christians, that they, everything is capsulized in that little phrase. Well, praise God, I miss hell and I'm going to heaven. 
that's not what, was all, what it was all about. It was about bringing to pass the abundance that Jesus said he came to bring us. So, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So, I, apparently, I can be that. And, most importantly, Father is expecting me to be that. So if I'm not that, then I am in fact being disobedient. Because he said, be that. Be strong. So that means I can. So we're talking about and what we're going to be discussing in detail. And don't tell me you know it all because I'll ask you at periodic points in this teaching to tell me what am I going to say next. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to God, yes, 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 I already know that, I heard that, we'll find out if you heard it, if you heard it, you should be able to repeat it, mm-hmm, yeah, right, mm-hmm, okay, <laughs> so, uh, never take it for granted that you know everything, you should be in a mode of learning, so we're talking about six principles to obtaining this strong faith, it doesn't happen automatically, it, it doesn't happen just because you've been born again, or even just because you've been filled with the Spirit. It's something we have to do. There are things we need to incorporate into our lives that will produce that so-called strong faith. And if we don't do certain things, then we're going to have the opposite of strong, which is what? Weak. All right. So let's look at principles. These are principles that apply and function and operate in the kingdom of God and should be functioning in our lives individually. Okay? All right. Principle number one is what? Okay. We must know, not hope, not think. We must what? Know. know the reality of the word of God. I ha you have to be convinced that this is God talking to you. If you don't believe that, if you don't know that, you'll never, ever be strong in faith. You have to know that you know that you know that this is, in fact, God speaking to you. This is an email from God. All right now. Carries the same weight as it does when I send an email to my assistant. I can be on the other side of the world or the planet, and I have to give instructions to my assistant about certain things that I want done while I'm away. And when I send that email, it's the same as if I walked into her office, looked her in her eyes, and said, thus and so. Carries the same weight. That's right. And if she doesn't do that, or any subordinate that, that may be under you in terms of your management oversight, it's like you have been, you repudiated what your boss or your overseer said to you. You're in violation. You're being disobedient. And enough disobedience can lead to some action that you won't like. You know, like termination or demotion, you know, things like that. And so there are principles that we need to know. We must know the reality of the Word of God. Now, let's go back. We looked at this before, but I, I didn't finish it. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We were talking about something that I, I feel is extremely important. <clears throat> and I, I harp on it, I stay on it, because your lifestyle gives you away. Your, your lifestyle will say something even when your mouth is closed. You know what I mean? Just the things you do in terms of your actions, uh, where you find yourself in terms of life situations, all of those things speak sometimes more loudly than your words. That's true. Absolutely. And so as I have had the privilege not only to be the pastor here in days gone by, but in traveling all over the world ministering the word, I found people are the same. I mean, I mean they're the same. We, we just went to... Uh, Again, Angela will give you some updates on that. But we went to several different African nations. One was Tanzania. And in Tanzania, I had to minister with an interpreter. And people are the same. Even though the language was different, the net result was the same in terms of people's experience. And their needs had the same needs. 
speak a different language, but the same ba basic needs. And so I find that I need to go over and over and over until everybody has the message. And it should be reflected in the life that you live and in the way you relate to the ministry, to the church, to your husband, to your wife, your family, etc. It, it, it gives you away. And so it's very important. So this little thing that I use, it's not just a play on words. It's not just some clever uh, dissertation, but it's a real principle. Now, case in point, 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you have it, say I have it. All right, verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete or mature, fully developed, thoroughly or thoroughly equipped, equipped for every good work. Not equipped, but thoroughly or fully equipped for every good work. Now, I made this statement last time. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspire means to breathe in. Expire means to breathe out. Okay? Inspired. It says all scripture, all of it. Scripture is another word for the Bible. Holy writ. God's word. Okay? It says all scripture is given by inspiration, which means that God inspired his word to be written. He didn't write it, but he inspired others that he called to that task, and he gave them the words, and all they did was record them. In other words, they didn't conceive the thoughts, they didn't make up the thoughts, but God did, but they became like court stenographers, or in the old days when the secretary took dictation, in shorthand, they don't, the, the secretary didn't make up a letter, unless you told them that, but ordinarily if you give them a dictation, all they're supposed to do is take it down verbatim, Fix it up, dress it up, put it on the letterhead, and mail it out. Get you to sign it, and that's it, right? Inspiration. So inspired, it, God inspired his word to be written. Now watch this now. All scripture is given by inspiration, but I made this statement, and it's not attempting to make some kind of a clever statement, but it's a truth that you need to understand if you want to get the maximum benefit out of this word. I said this, based on this 16 verse. Everything... In the Bible is truly stated. But everything in the Bible is not a statement of truth. Did you get that? Yeah. And that is so that's <laughs> that's so critical to understand. Watch this now. Every repeat after me. Everything, everything. In, the Bible in the Bible is truly stated. It's truly stated. But everything, but everything in the Bible, in the Bible is, not is not a statement of truth. Okay, repeat that again. One more time. Okay, now that doesn't, that does not invalidate the Bible. The problem has been that ever since time immemorial, Christians have taken for granted that everything that's recorded between the covers of this book was directly from God in that it was true. And they didn't understand that the Bible is a record of things that occurred as they occurred and so there are things in the Bible that are recorded that happen. Someone said that, someone did that, someone did not do that. But we thought that because it was in the Bible that what was recorded, that the event was true, right. that what the person said was true, or that what the person did was true, and that's not always the case. Now, keep your finger, well, actually, you don't even have to go there, but look right back, uh, the second chapter, verse 15. It says... Now, I'm reading from the New King James. It says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I like the tradition. It says, study, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I asked the question last time. I said, why do you ever divide anything? 
to break it up into component parts. Right? Divide. Why would you have to divide God's word if God's word, every single word in it on the page, every single word was directly from God and it was a true, it was true, then why would you have to divide what's true? Are you following me? So the very fact that it says study so you can rightly, and you never use rightly except to distinguish from wrongly, which means if I don't study, it's possible to wrongly divide, and that's what has happened down through time. People have wrongly divided, and that's why the whole thing has been messed up down through the years, because of now studying. Just take it for granted because, well, you know, Grandma was one, and Uncle George was one, and we've always been one of those. We've gone to that church all our lives. So what? If you've been going to the wrong church <laughs> or, or, or whatever, then you've just been wrong for a long period of time. So it's very important to understand. So he's, it says study to show yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we went to Job, I mean Job. Let's go there now. Book of Job chapter 1. I have to know the reality of the word of God. If I'm going to be strong in faith, I have to know the reality, but I also have to know how to divide the word of God because everything, watch this, everything recorded in this book is not for everyone. I, I just want to pause so that that can sink into some. Everything in the book is not for everyone. And you have to know that so that you don't attempt to apply something to your life that's not for you. What does that mean, everything is not for everyone? Well, God only sees three people, three different classes of mankind on the earth. See, we look at black, red, white, brown, and yellow. We look at these different so-called ethnicities. God doesn't see black, white, brown, red, or yellow. God doesn't see that. God only sees three people on the planet. Three kinds of people. Jew, Gentile, and the church of God. That's it. And everything in this book applies either to Jew, Gentile, or the church of God, or Christians. Now, if you don't know the difference, you can take something that's only for the Jew and try to apply it to the Gentile and it won't fly. Or you can take something that applies to the Gentile that doesn't apply to the church and it won't fly. That's why you have to learn how to rightly divide so that you don't take something and try to appropriate it into your life that's only for the Jew. There's certain things only for the Jew. For instance, the law of Moses. Oh boy, we're getting on something now. The law of Moses. The law of Moses is not for everybody. It's just for, that was for the Jew. It wasn't for the Gentile. The Gentile wasn't even included when God gave the law to Moses. It was for, for the Jews. And there are things today that are just for the Jews, not for the Christian. And some Christian trying to do what the Jews are supposed to do, and, and, and it, 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 don't, it won't work. Vice versa, the Jew trying to do something that applies to the Christian. And you need to know so that you don't try to take something that's for the Jew or the Gentile as a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and try to apply it. Only three people God sees. The Jew, the Gentile, and the body of Christ. So I have to rightly divide so that I don't misappropriate and or miss out on things I should have thinking it's only for the Jew or only for the Christian or for the Gentile, the non-Jew. Okay? Everybody that's not a Jew is the Gentile. Okay? All right. Dr. Price taught a series called The Christian Family, which helped many understand their roles as husbands, wives, and even children. In this series, you will learn how to avoid or handle the pitfalls of marriage and family life in a practical way. Well, when I got uh, filled with the Spirit and I began to understand the covenant of God and how God had provided for us, I figured that since He's the Creator, He must know better than anybody else. He's the one that originated the family. The very first institution that God instituted was the family. In the book of Genesis, it talks about a man uh, shall lead his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So I figured if God has set that up, then he must know down the line that there are certain things that will work, certain things that won't work. So I made a decision that I was going to follow the Word of God, 
and given an opportunity to fail, but it hasn't failed. This teaching by Apostle Frederick K.C. Price is available on CD, DVD, or book. Call 800-927-3436 or go to faithdome.org and get yours today. Now, having said that, Book of Job. I'll be, I'll be very brief. Every, most everybody knows the story about Job. Uh, there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came in before God to make a report. And Satan was in the midst. And God said, Satan, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro throughout the earth, seeking whom I could devour. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil said, yeah, yeah, sure, I've been watching him closely. But you have a hedge built around him. If you pull a hedge down, he'll curse you to your face. And so God said to Satan, well, behold, look, see. Everything that he has is in your power. And I pointed this out before last time, meaning because we live in this world, all of us live in some sort of society. You know, some sort of society. And we're under some sort of law and governance by some governmental authorities, no matter where you live on the planet. And all those systems are dominated by Satan. Now, that's not to say that they're not good people in positions of leadership, but Satan's influence basically ends up controlling because if it were not so, then the laws would be more fair to everyone. And you wouldn't have so many have-nots and a few haves. There would be a more even distribution, all things being equal, of things on the planet. But we all have to operate in these different systems. Jesus called Satan the prince of this world, which means ruler. He also called the god of this age. So he, he runs the world system or influences the world system. That's why they're so unequal. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, look, see, all that he has is in your power. Meaning, because we're here, we could be influenced by satanic forces. That's, that's all that means. Be, guess what? Because all of us are on the planet, we're all influenced by the sun. Take it or leave it, like it or lump it. If we're on this world, on this planet, <laughs> you're going to be influenced by the sun. All right? So it's the same thing in terms of the things that have to do with Satan. And, and at this time, Satan didn't even know that because he doesn't know everything. He's not God. And just because he's an antagonist of God, just because he's the, 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 the prime antagonist, it, everybody has assumed he's on an equal level with God in terms of knowledge. Only, the only thing Satan knows is what we tell him with our big fat mouths. That's why we need to be very careful what we say. Because if he knew everything, don't you think he would stop any progress that we would attempt to make in terms of the body of Christ? If we were going to build a church, he'd stop us before we got started. But he can't, he only knows what we tell him. And he can only influence what we give him influence over. So, God said, look, see, behold, all that he has is in your power. So Satan went out and brought all this stuff against Job. Well, you know the story, he lost everything. Got down to the point where his wife said, man, curse God and die, fool. You just going through all this stuff, you know. And finally, Job, here we go. Finally, Job said this. After everything was over, bad news. I mean, the, the 6 o'clock evening news and CNN and all the rest of them, KNBC, all of them had brought all this bad news. All your kids are dead. Your cattle had been stolen, killed or burned. Your house fell down. I mean, just all bad news. I mean, you couldn't find any, a worse scenario than what happened to Job. And then in verse 20, it said, Then Job arose. Chapter 1 of the book of Job, you got it? Okay. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, what does it say? Yes. What does it say? What is it? Verse 21, first part of verse 21? Yes. Say what? Yes. I didn't hear you. Yes. No, and God said. Yes. No, no, the angel said. Yes. No, Satan said. Yes. Say what? Yes. Huh? Yes. Speak up. Job said. Oh, 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 I got it, I got it. Oh, Job's, okay, all right. Verse 21, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now that very first part of that 21st verse said, and 
he said. So we could read it like this, and Job said. So that's truly stated. Job said it, and it was recorded. But the content of what he said was not a statement of truth. God did not take those things away from Job. That's a big difference. I've heard it in days gone by in a, in a funeral or memorial service. Where somebody died, unexpected die, uh, death, not somebody that lived to 99 years old and just, you know, got so old they died, but somebody taken in the prime of life. And the preacher said, well, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, where did he get that? He got it out of the Bible, but he didn't rightly divide it. He didn't rightly divide it. And it leaves a false impression. It leaves the impression God is a killer. Amen. So I don't want to get too close to God or the things of God. He might decide to take me out. <laughs> so if I can hide from God and don't get too involved with him, then I might be able to skate through and not be destroyed. Well, see, this was Job's estimation of the situation. Not God's. Not even Satan's. This was Job. You just read it right there, first part. And he said, not in God said, he said, who Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's not true. Ah, it's truly stated, but it's not a statement of truth. And there are many scriptures in the Bible like that, that if you just read over them and gloss over them, you won't even take time to divine them, and you'll say things or take things out of the Bible that were truly stated, but were not statements of truth that's why you need to study so you can rightly divide okay and that, that's that's very important to know that differential so that you don't end up blaming God for something he didn't do and giving Satan credit for something he doesn't deserve all because of not rightly dividing the word now because this is not the actual lesson, I'm not going to go into the whole thing about Job, but I wanted to use that one illustration because I think it's so critically important to understand when you read the Bible, you've got to analyze what are you reading, who said what, who said it, who did it, where, what were the circumstances, so that you don't get the wrong impression and end up blaming God for things he didn't do. God is not a killer. Oh, but he'll let you die. He'll let you die. He'll let Satan kill you. He'll let Satan rob you and cheat you because he doesn't control it. We do. That's why he gave us this master plan. If we follow the plan, the blueprints, the schematic diagram, we won't have as many challenges that we can't overcome. Amen. God didn't create us to have us like puppets on a string. If that were true, he would have made us like the animal kingdom where we did everything instinctively. We wouldn't have to think about anything. We have one of the greatest gifts of all creation, and that is the gift of choice. We can choose to obey or disobey. We can choose to follow God or not follow God. We can choose to do whatever we good will please. And God has to let us do it because if he does it, then he's violating our free will. And if he violates our free will, he can't call us into judgment about any decisions that we made. Amen. Amen. It's easy to prove. I've used the illustration before. But each one of you, I don't see. Now, I don't want to, so don't, don't you know. But I don't see, just from, maybe some foot way in the back, I can't see from up here. But I don't see anybody in here that's naked. <laughs> well, that's graphic. I want you to get the point. I don't see anybody in here that's naked. Right now, all I see are clothed creatures. <laughs> Not people, but creatures. No, people. Everybody I see it, it, it has on some clothes. And guess what? God let you out of the house this morning with that stuff you have on. <laughs> Didn't he? Yes, sir. And I'll wager you chose to put on what you have on. Yes, and God let you get away with it. Let you out of the house. Let you come into public with that horrendous dress. <laughs> Those terrible looking shoes. I'm joking about the shoes and the dress. But it sounds silly and comical, but it, think about it, it's true. And God will let you out of the house with cancer. He'll let you out of the house with fear. He'll let you out of the house with stress. He'll let you out of the house with envy, with jealousy, with strife, with racism. He doesn't control it. We do. 
Amen, okay? So, we have to know the reality of the Word of God. All right, let's look at something else. John chapter 6. We must know the reality of the Word of God. This is God speaking to me. It's an email from God. Instructions on how to live. And again, God is not trying to control us. He's trying to influence us in a positive way whereby we can maximize our time here on the planet. Because like I said, over there, if God wanted to control us, he would have never given us free will. In fact, if he had not given us free will, he wouldn't have so many problems. Humanity is a problem. And all because of free will. I haven't, heard, I haven't heard of any animal in the animal kingdom attempting to take over the world. <laughs> Think about it. Sounds funny, but it's, it's true. I haven't heard of any animals in the animal kingdom attempting to come up with a coup against the other animals. I haven't heard of any animals in the animal kingdom strapping any C4 around them and walking into a restaurant of other animals and killing them all. No terrorists in, in, in the animal kingdom that I know of. Now, I don't know everything. Could be some, but it's funny. You think you'd hear about it somewhere on CNN, somewhere, sometime. But all the problems are human problems. People influenced by Satan who don't even know they're being influenced to do things that are detrimental and destructive and God has to let it happen because of free will. But he's given us this. If everybody understood this and if everybody on the planet did it, we have a wonderful place to live. I said this. I didn't say any kind of church doctrine and I didn't say any kind of denominational doctrine and I didn't say anything about theology. I said this. this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we won't go the other places because some of that other stuff, that also contributed to a lot of confusion and heartache and horrendous things that have happened. But this, if everyone observed this judiciously, regularly, as it's stated, we wouldn't have problems. Not like we have now. Okay, John chapter what? Six. Six. We must know the reality of the word of God. You still here? Yes. All right. Okay. John chapter 6, verse 63. Now, <clears throat> verse 63 says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Now, this is Jesus the Christ speaking. And this is what he said. He said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The word that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. All right, what is, what's he talking about? Well, again, unfortunately, our Bibles that we have are translations from other languages. Okay? And primarily the New Testament that's classified as the New Testament came from the Greek world or the Greek language, the primary Manuscripts that are accepted. There were some others, Aramaic and things like that. But the, the Greek has been given credit for most of our English translation. And translators are human. I haven't heard of any orangutans translating the Bible from Hebrew and or Greek. I mean, I, maybe you have. If you have, I'd like to be introduced to them. But, and I didn't say it to be funny, but just simply to show you that this is the product of, 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 of man to the degree that he understood or understands the language. But you have to be a really disciplined, honest person to translate verbatim, as it were, without allowing your pre- prejudices from some sort of religious background to infiltrate your translation. J 
just strictly by language. It actually would be better. I'm really going to get into it with this one, but you know, I live on the edge anyway. <laughs> but it would almost be better to just have unregenerate, non Christian scholars that know the language to do the translations. Because then they don't bring into it their denominational preferences or their theological exposures. So then things would be just like they were original. Now here, all I said, all I have to say this. How, does anybody have a traditional King James Version with you? Oh, yes, yeah, well, I keep, keep forgetting. Okay, now watch this. I want to show you something. That's why we need, we have, we have to study. All right, I want to read that verse again. Verse 63. It says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. How many of you have the New King James? Okay. Okay, notice it says, it is the spirit. And notice that the word spirit is capitalized. So traditionally, when you see the word spirit capitalized, that infers that it's talking about what? The Holy Spirit. And in most cases, that's true. But how is it rendered in the tradition of King James? Small s. Small s. Not capitalized s, small s. So who's right? I am, obviously. <laughs> I say that with humility and modesty. No, but seriously, there it is right there. And this Bible, before they came up with the New King James, that was the Bible of preference for years in American society, Western civilization. And yet that word spirit is small case, which indicates it's talking about man's spirit, where the New King James puts it capitalized as which makes it talking about, or meaning that it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, which one is right? Well, it's really easy to determine which one is right if you understand other parameters. If you don't, well, then you just go along with what's stated, and that's confusion. I mean, one is capitalized and one is small case. What is it? Can be both. Well, it's real easy the New King James, as good as it is, because it does have some good qualities to it. The primary reason that I, because I was the one that introduced the New King, King James here to the church overall, I'm not saying that others didn't pick it up and use it, but that, that it became really the, 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 the translation of, of, of uh, note was because I wasn't brought up in the church world. Uh, and, in other words, I wasn't brought up in a Christian household, okay? So I didn't go to church when I was a kid. I didn't get into Christianity until I got married, my wife and I married. And um, when I got saved and I was encouraged by the counselor that led me, uh, you know, told me what I had done when I came forward in the invitation and told me what that was all about, he encouraged me to get involved in a church. I had to join a church and get involved. So, fine, that's what I did. Well, when I got to the church, I noticed that everybody was talking about these and thous and wherefores and comest thou. I said, what is all of that? We don't talk that way now. And some people think that that's God talking, that that's the way he talked. And they don't realize that's the way they talked in 1611. Amen. When King James authorized the Bible, which was not available to the general public at that time, to put it into the language of the common people, that's the way they talked in 1611. Amen. Therefore, thus... <coughs> thou, all that stuff. That, you don't talk that way now. And so I couldn't, you know, I said, that, is that to me it makes it phony. It makes it like, this must not be true. Why, why, what? We don't talk like that. And so when they came out with the new King James, I said, oh, this is wonderful because now it puts it in the language that we talk today without stretching it like some of the other translations. They take it, in my opinion, too far. This is almost traditional King James, because believe it or not, the traditional King James Bible is an excellent translation. Except for the these and the thous and, and all of the archaic English, it's a good translation. Okay? None of them are perfect because they're all by humans. But when they translated this New King James, I don't know who the so-called scholars were that translated it, but apparently they didn't understand they didn't understand some things. Let me say it that way. Now, let, let me show you how you can tell. You don't have to take my word for it. Just use your head. You know, God did give you a brain. 
for something other than storing sand. It's amazing how we will not do any thinking on our own. Watch this now. It says, it is a spirit who gives life. The flesh prop is nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. Small case, that's exactly as it ought to be. But, 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 but let me ask you a question. How can words that come out of your mouth be spirits? You mean words are entities? They have life? They have brains? They have eyes? They have ears? They have shape and form? Jesus said the words I speak, they are spirit. Well, all other Bible explanations of spirits is that they are creatures of some sort, just living primarily in a different dimension. So what did he mean? All right. It's real simple when you understand, again, all the things that are involved. When it says it is the spirit who gives life, the pre flesh profits nothing, then what it's saying is that it's the Holy Spirit who gives life and the flesh profits nothing. Well, that's not true. The Holy Spirit doesn't give life. Remember this, or be informed. And see, this takes us far afield to another area. We have to analyze what is man? What, what we be? <laughs> Here's my best grammar. What we be? Well, if you know the word of God. In fact, keep your finger right there quickly and uh, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You know this, but let me, I want you to see it in the word for yourself. Especially for the internet viewers and the naysayers. They're trying to find, they always want to try to find something wrong. So I want to give them scripture and then they can meditate and argue about this if they want to. Uh, did I tell you chapter 5? Yes. Okay. First Thessalonians chapter 5. If you have it, say, I have it. Okay. Watch this, verse 23. Now, Paul speaking, he says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, or as the tradition says, holy, which means completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at or until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse clearly reveals the fact that man is a tri, T, T like in Tom, T-R-I, tripartite, which means three-part creation. Takes three parts to make us who we are. And notice where God starts. He always starts from the inside out. We always start from the outside and never get in. Seriously, we always start with the flesh because that's what we see and we think what we see is us but what we see is not us. Look at this very clearly. He says, may your whole spirit, soul and body. So we are spirits, we have souls and we live in bodies. Okay, keep your, <laughs> keep your finger on John and let's establish what I just said, if that's true or if that's just the fantasy of Fred Price. Keep your finger on John and go to Genesis chapter 1. That's why we are supposed to study, so we can get all this together and get the right perspective on things. We are Try, try, T R I, tripartite, which means three parts. Tricycles usually have three wheels. Bicycles usually have two wheels. And unicycles usually have one wheel. We are tri, three parts. Okay. Now, Paul, who we just read in Thessalonians, Paul said, May your whole spirit, soul, body. God starts with the inside, works to the outside. 
most of the time we start with the outside and never get into the inside. Because we're, you know, we're creatures of habit and, and basically all we have ever really known is what we see. So our assumption is that that's who we are. What we see, oh yeah, he's white and that's black and there's a yellow one over there and there's a brown one over there and there's a red one, complexion over there. And that's how we get all screwed up into this racism or racial or ethnic prejudice because we're looking at the outside and never get to the inside. Oh well, yeah, I didn't go over too well, I'm going to move on. Okay, Genesis chapter 1, if you ever see I have it. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Oh, I want to stop right there. Pick up on that. Look at it again. He said, then God said, let us make man. Us is plural, and they're talking about the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's all that means. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Well, what's the image of God? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Well, what is God like? Well, keep your finger right there on Genesis. I want to come back to that. <laughs> Here we go again. That's how you got it. That's why you have to study. So you can put it all together. Okay. Um, go to John. You're already in the sixth chapter. Back up to chapter four. Because all of the truth of God is connective. And you have to put it together to get the whole story. Okay? We, we read so far where he said, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So I would assess that statement as meaning, if God is going to create man after God's likeness, it seems to me that it's saying that he's going to make me like him. Is that a fair estimation? He's not going to make me God, but he's going to make me like him. Well, I have to know what him is like. So I need to know what him is like to know how I'm made after his likeness. Okay, Jesus is in Samaria and he had an encounter with the woman at a well Jacob well in Samaria and in the course of their dialogue they got into some religious or spiritual things and uh, Jesus gave the woman or made a statement to the woman that's relevant to what we're talking about look at the 24th verse it says God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now again, I'm reading from the King James Bible, uh, New King James. And in terms of my evaluation, they missed it again. Because in the traditional, it says God is a spirit. And I believe that that's more germane to the true, true issue. Why? Simply because... Studying the Bible, you're going to find out angels are spirits, demons are spirit, man is a spirit, God is a spirit, Holy Spirit is a spirit. So if you just say God is spirit, then you classify him with all other spirits. But a spirit means he's separate and distinct from other spirits. Just like I am in terms of exterior, in terms of our society, I am black. She be white. Somebody else here would be yellow. Somebody else be red. Somebody else be brown. That's the classification that we make. But we're all humans. We're all homo sapiens, either males or females. Usually either one or the other. Okay. All right now. Don't, hey. Okay. It says God. So let's read it. I want to read it like the, the tradition says. Jesus. Now, remember. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> That's why you got, that's why you got, okay, go to John chapter 1. <laughs> well, this is, how, this is how you learn. This is how you learn. You put it all together and get the right picture. If you leave a part out, have you ever, uh, I, don't, I don't hear or see much about it anymore. I'm not saying it's not true, but I know when I was, when I was younger, a kid, we used to have things called jigsaw puzzles. It was a big thing. We didn't have the, 
we didn't have all the computers and all the little uh, stuff that we have now, people working on things, got all kind of games and stuff you draw off the internet. It's great. But we used to have these things called jigsaw puzzles. And it was, a, it was a picture and it was stamped out with all kind of little different shapes. And if you put all the shapes together, it made a, a, a picture. I used to do that and I would coat them on the back with glue and put a pasteboard on them and make pictures out of them and put frames around them and hang them. Because there were some beautiful pictures, you know, that they made for puzzles. Well, the worst thing in all the world is to spend all your time working on this puzzle, get to the end and a piece is missing. <laughs> oh, if you've never worked when you don't, you don't, you don't even have a clue as to what I'm talking about. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, terrible. Get to you, spend all this time working on that puzzle and get to the end and a piece is missing. It's your fault. You did it. I'm joking. Okay? Well, it's the same thing in studying the Word of God. If there's a piece missing, it just, it's not complete. Okay? Now, Jesus said to the woman at the well, God is a spirit. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, that English word, W-O-R-G, is the Greek word, L-O-G-O-S, which means Jesus, the Christ, in eternity past. Okay, and in the beginning, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Don't you remember we read it in Genesis? It said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are alike. He said, in our plural likeness. So whatever the Father is, the Son is, the Holy Spirit is. No, the Holy Spirit's not God the Father. God the Father is not God the Son. God the Son is not the Holy Spirit. But they're the same essence. They're the, they're the same in the sense that they're at their core, who they are, their spirit. Okay, watch this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Question, if, 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 if the Logos, Jesus the Christ, before he became human flesh. If he was with God in the beginning, do you think that maybe he might know what God is and what God ain't? Does that seem reasonable? If he was with God, he ought to know who God was and who God was not. And he said God is a spirit. Okay, go back to Genesis quickly. Wow, okay. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our likeness. Or in our image, what's, what's an image? Can, can we get a consensus of opinion in the English language? What, what's an image? I mean, if you go home and look in the mirror, you shouldn't see me in the mirror. You better see you. Or you got a distorted mirror. <laughs> yeah, some big, gigantic problem. Would a, would a photograph be an image? A reflection in the pool of water? Right? Image. Okay, watch this now. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Well, what is God like? Well, Jesus said God is a spirit. So then we must be like God in that we are spirits. We're not angels because angels are also spirits. That's another story that we could get into. It's in the Bible very clearly. But we're, we're human spirits, not angelic spirits, not Demon spirits, even though some act like demons. <laughs> and they call any name. Okay, watch this now. It said, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now that word image in the Hebrew language is salim. And it means counterpart. So we're, we're like God in that we are what God is. In terms of spirit, we're not animals. We're not birds. We're not fish. We're spirits. Okay. Go back now to John 6, 63. You still here? Yes. Okay, John 6, 63. I know you already know all this, but anyway. Okay, verse 63 says, It is the Spirit who gives life. I submit to you that that word spirit should be small case that is talking about the human spirit. Why? Because the human spirit is you. And you and I are out of time. So stay right where you are. If this message has been a blessing to you, the announcer will tell you some very important information about how you may obtain a CD, DVD of the message that you've just heard for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. Remember again that these telecasts and radio broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers, and listeners. Remember also these.